power of going past players and eventually gets brought down just inside the penalty area. No question about the fact that it was a penalty. Um, and, and like I said, Matteo Genduzzi was the catalyst for Arsenal getting back into this game. His energy, his passion, his desire, all things that can't be questioned. You can question his technical ability at times. You can question the fact that he's a little bit rash. You can sometimes question his positional sense. But in terms of heart, passion, desire to win, you cannot question that about Matteo Genduzzi. You've got to say. Um, wins the penalty. And I'm standing there thinking, Jesus Christ, why is Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, who's in such a rich vein of form in front of goal, not taking this penalty? And it, it, it came out in the aftermath that Aubameyang's given the penalty to Pepe um, to give him that that first Arsenal goal, to give him that lift, to give him that confidence boost. And that's something we've seen from Aubameyang before. He gave a penalty to Lacazette when he was having a hard time, if you remember. And, you know, that's really rare to see in a striker because strikers are usually selfish and rightly so. You know, he, he was in the running for the golden boot last year. He finished joint top. Uh, and you'd imagine that he'll be up there again this season and he wants to win that. So to give up a penalty, which is almost uh, your bread and butter for a striker, is is really unselfish. And I think, you know, let's hope now that Pepe uh, takes that on and, and builds on that because Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang there has done a, a great thing. Um, but just moments later, Aston Villa go and go back in front. And I cannot express to you how pissed off and angry I was when that goal went in and that goal is just a, a, a catalogue of errors you know there's a pass from David Lewis out to Callum Chambers which you know you you could say it's not a bad pass but it's a difficult pass to control doesn't excuse Callum Chambers there he should control that it's poor um, whether that pass was the right pass to make it is another matter Callum Chambers fails to control it. Villa pick up the ball and they break on us. And Jack Grealish gets to the sort of left-hand side of the penalty area. He's dribbling. The right-back is caught out of position. You see Socrates go over, having to go over, which clears some space in the middle. Grealish cuts the ball back brilliantly. Grealish, who I thought was really, really good, by the way. I think he's a fantastic player. Uh, really stylish, really silky. And I think in a better team, you'd see the best of Jack Grealish. But anyway... He pulls the ball back across the goal. And then I'm looking for David Lewis to be aware of his surroundings. He's got to be side on. He's got to be aware of players making runs into the box. And it feels to me like he's just completely unaware of Wesley's run. And he just takes too long to adjust himself. And before you know it, Wesley's nipped in front of him and, and got a foot to it. And Villa are back in front. And I was really, really pissed off, really disappointed, as I'm sure most of the stadium were. You know, Arsenal had been given a lifeline a, a way back into this game and then to throw that that away just moments after was just so typical of this Arsenal side and, and typical of the way we defend and it was really really disappointing and you know some people will say that it was Callum Chambers' fault I think that when you lose the ball there you still got to be able to defend that scenario and I don't think David Lewis has defended that anywhere near well enough and it feels like David Lewis is given a goal away every week. And I doubt there's a striker in the league that contributes to that many goals. But, you know, yeah, he might be a good footballer on the ball. He might be competent in possession. He might be integral to the way that we want to play out from the back. But you cannot be costing us a goal pretty much every week now. I think that's four um, so far this season. It's just not good enough. And um, Unai Emery needs to take a long, hard look at that. And I don't care if he's a new signing. I don't care... Um, that he's been brought in from Chelsea, that if you're not good enough and you're making mistakes, then, you know, you can't be in the team. And as for Socrates, he's just as fucking bad. Um, in fact, he's fucking awful, if I'm being honest. Uh, has been for a long time. Was never to Arsenal standards, in my opinion. I said that from the very beginning. And he's starting to get found out now. Will either of them look better next to Rob Holding? Maybe. Um but that is just speculation at the moment. We'll have to see how Rob Holding comes back into the team and whether he can get to fitness quickly and what impact he will have. And, and fingers crossed it's a positive one because we really, really fucking need it. Um, then Arsenal, of course, uh, managed to get that equaliser. Callum Chambers made up for his, his fuck-up or his part in that goal, in my opinion, by getting that second goal. Um, 
again, Genduzi, brilliant. Um, I think Genduzi had a shot that cannoned off the post as well um, in between those two incidents, uh, which was a great effort from outside the box. Again, Genduzi taking the game by the scruff of the neck. He seemed to be popping up in every single position. He was everywhere at that point. It was like we were playing with a one-man midfield. Um, but Callum Chambers did really, really well to pounce on a, on a Villa mistake, on a Tyrone Mings mistake. Genduzi played a ball uh, over the top. Chambers made a move into the penalty area, tried to cut the ball back across. Uh, Tyrone Mings failed to clear, and there was Chambers to take a touch and, uh, and just poke it into the net. Uh, and a brilliant goal, uh, brilliant poacher's finish, actually, from someone who uh, splits his time between the centre-back and right-back positions. Um, and, and Arsenal were level. And then, of course, Unai Emery made those two changes, which had a huge impact. Xhaka and Ceballos went off um, to be replaced by Willock and Torreira. And there was cheers when Granit Xhaka was taken off. And I don't give a shit what anybody says. Under no circumstances will I back fans doing that to a player. It's just not on. You're, you're Arsenal fans. Voice your opinion before, voice your opinion after. But during the game, that was really, really unhelpful, in my opinion. Absolutely killed Granit Xhaka. And, and, and Granit Xhaka, you know, yeah, he wasn't great, but he wasn't the worst player on the pitch. That whole fucking midfield were non-existent up until that point. All three of them. Danny Ceballos was shit yesterday. Danny Ceballos was taken off as well. But people will say, oh, you know, Arsenal changed the game when Granit Xhaka went off. Danny Sabas was just as bad. Danny Sabas was crap. He was taken off too. Willock and Torreira gave us a little bit of energy um, and gave us that boost. And that's why that change worked really, really well. Um, but again, the question is, should we be praising Unai Emery for making that change? Or should we be criticising him for getting it wrong in the first place? And I'm kind of in the middle on this. Um, so yeah, I I'm not too... Pissed off about his initial selection because, like I said, I went with the same thing by one player. But the lack of direction, the lack of, you know, shape, the lack of ideas in that team, it is down to Unai Emery because we seem to play these same monotonous patterns of play, the play out from the back, the same shit over and over and over again. And that's down to his coaching. And that's that's a real issue for me. Um but again, coming back to Genduzi, who was fucking sensational. And in the second half, not not throughout, but in the second half, he was sensational. And he reminded me of a young Cesc Fabregas. You know, the way he just took the game by the scruff of the neck, didn't give a shit about what people said, got in people's faces, was tough, aggressive, um, put his body about, but also picked out the right passes and, and, and done all the right things and showed a bit of maturity. The difference is that Cesc Fabregas could have done that for 90 minutes. And I don't think Matteo Guendouzi is quite at that level yet. So a long way to go in terms of his development. Um, and then, of course, the third. And the goal that sent the Emirates absolutely wild. It was um, uh, Arsenal pressing from the front. Something we saw when Unai Emery first came in, but has obviously disappeared. Arsenal clearly got the bit between their teeth and felt that they could win this. And they pressed... The defence, they won the ball back. I think it was Willock that played the ball to Aubameyang. He went to take on a couple of players, got taken down on the edge of the box. The ball went to Torreira, but the referee pulled it back for the free kick. And Aubameyang dispatched it brilliantly. Question marks over Villa's goalkeeper? There are some. Um, because, you know, that's the side where he should be covering and you wonder why he didn't uh, make a greater effort to save it. But it's a fantastic free kick from Aubameyang under lots and lots of pressure and ultimately so big, so important for this team uh, to get that three points and get over the line. It was really, really crucial. And at that point, I didn't even know whether to celebrate or not because given the defensive fragilities that we'd shown, I wasn't sure that we were going to hold on to it. And of course, Villa went down the other end and uh, you know there were mad appeals for a penalty when Socrates handled the ball in the box. And there was an injustice with the Ainsley Maitland-Niles sending off. And I was really, really pissed off about it when I saw it back. But I've got to say that Villa can feel incensed that they didn't get a penalty for that. Because that's a clear handball. He leans into it and it clearly strikes his arm. And again, what on earth are VAR doing? Sitting there scratching their asses, I don't know. 
because that is a shocking, shocking decision. Fortunately for us, this time it went in our favour. But on another day, that is a stonewall penalty. On most days, that is a stonewall penalty. And Socrates once again proving that he's a fucking liability. Uh, apologies for the swearing. I, I, I can't help it. I, I, I just don't know how to feel after games like that. In the end, Arsenal got the three points. Uh, in the end, it was a good weekend given the results around us. Chelsea, United and Spurs all suffering defeats. So a positive weekend overall. But let's not allow the result to paper over those cracks. Those are my thoughts uh, on, on the win over Aston Villa. Uh, going to take a short break. And then we're going to hear from former Arsenal midfielder David Hillier and get his take uh, on that wild 90 minutes at the Emirates. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna. David Hillier, absolute pleasure to have you back, mate. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm well, thanks, H. Um, happy after yesterday's result, but not so happy with the performance. But, um, you know, we're up there and that's, that's all we need to be at the moment until we get things dead right. Yeah, I absolutely share your sentiment. Uh, pleased with the, the overall result in the end. And, of course, the results around us, you know, seem to go our way as well. So it was a positive weekend. But there are lots of question marks around the performance. I've spoken already on the show about my thoughts on it and, and the various incidents. David, your overall feeling, you know, in regards to Arsenal's performance, and, and, and there's quite clearly some areas that we still need to work on, isn't there? Oh, ab absolutely. I don't, I don't think um, at the moment they're playing as a complete unit. I think the midfield are a bit disjointed from the defence. Um, we've got this issue with getting pressure on the ball um, and our defence dropping off, in, in my opinion, we're doing it way too often and with an experienced defender like David Lewis you shouldn't be doing it but I think because of a little bit of lack of pace it, it, it suits him um, but just, just as well our boys up front are firing but then you say all that in the last 20 minutes yesterday well, what everybody wants for, for 90 minutes every Saturday so it is in there but it's getting it out of it getting it out of the team yeah, I mean, somebody made a really good point to me uh, in the stadium yesterday. Uh, a friend who sits in front of me, a gentleman called Lee, so shout out to Lee. He said, when you look at sort of the way that unfolded, you can see that there is individual brilliance in this team, but obviously the system is flawed. What do you make of the fact that Unai keeps changing the team? The midfield seems to be different every week. You know, it, it, is that a problem? Is continuity an issue? As yeah. someone who's played the game, you'd be able to tell us. Absolutely, continuity is a problem. Um, if, if you don't keep it, then you've got to be doing something really special in training to keep those players that you're pulling in and out of the side and rotating in top form on sort of premiership level, you know, ready to, ready to go because all players need a bit of adjustment time when you're coming back into like the first team from reserve team or PL2, whatever you want to call it now. Um, under 23s football and the changes do make a difference and I, I really don't think at the moment we've got a game overload that warrants this amount of change um, it'll be unsettling for the players because you you want to have a you know if you play well on a Saturday and you've got a game the following Wednesday you've got half an idea that you're going to be in the side because you played well this team haven't you know this team don't know what's happening so you can't really plan and prepare but for me that would affect me in the modern game I don't know if players are just happy to have a little rest now. Um, but, but for me, it would have been play every game, you know, work as hard as you can in each one. And the continuity issue adds to the sort of little defensive frailties we've got. You know, we've seen players come in and make mistakes. Players go out. We saw Callum Chambers come in yesterday and do really well. So will Callum hold his place um, in the side for the next PL game? Who knows? But for me... I, to answer your question, definitely you need to have a, a set 11, set 15, and anybody else who sneaks into it has to, has to earn that place. Absolutely, I agree with you. Uh, David, I, I've spoken about on this podcast about my disappointment at the reaction from the fans to when Granite Xhaka was taken off. I don't think that's helpful during a game. As someone who's been on the pitch for Arsenal... You know, that must be a real blow to the players' confidence, being almost 
cheered, you know, at the fact that he was taken off. I thought that was out of order. What's your What's your take on that? Yeah, it it, it is out of order. Um, he's come under a lot of lot of stick lately. Granted, um, at the end of last season, you know, he was he was he was pulled out quite a few times for his mistakes, and and he and he continues to do those sort of. Game errors, you know, pulling shirts, tackling from the wrong side, lunging in, um, bad decisions. And sometimes his distribution isn't what fans expect, but that still doesn't mean you need to do that to a player as he goes off the pitch. I, I, I think you have a little bit of respect. He doesn't pick the side. You know, he doesn't, put his, he doesn't pick himself in the side, Granit Xhaka. What he does is he works as hard as he can in training to get in the side. The manager picks the side. So... You know, you can't individually blast the player. But there are certain parts of his game that, if I was him, I'd be looking at saying, I need to do something about that because it's a, it's a constant. It's happening all the time. You know, it isn't just an anomaly. It's, it's, a, it's a regular thing. So how, what can I do to change that? How can I change my game plan? How can I change the way I do that? Um, but you say it had a negative effect on Granite, but look at the list it gave the team. And I'm not saying it was... It was the actual jeering of Granite Xhaka, but the introduction of some freshness and some freshness in different areas that, that did change the, the pattern of the team, um, it lifted us and, and it ended up being a very, very good substitution. But I wonder whether Unai will, um, will stick by that for the, for the games to come. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see because it does feel like since Unai's come in, and I know Wenger, you know, had Granit Xhaka down as one of his favourites as well, obviously brought him to the club, spent a substantial amount of money on him, but it feels like Unai Emery is very loyal to Granit Xhaka. He obviously sees something in Xhaka that maybe, as supporters at times, we don't necessarily see. Matteo Genduzzi, for me, I thought he was brilliant in the second half. I didn't think he was all that good in the first half. He's obviously a, a top quality player, someone who's got the right attitude to go to the very top. But does he need to be delivering that level of performance for the entire ninety minutes, rather than just in in spells? Yeah, he does. But I think I think what you get with uh, Grandozzi is you, you you get everything he's got as quick as he can give it, and he you know he does sort of he does wear out. <laughs> so so you get little spells in the game when he can't quite keep keep his game up because he wants to he wants to offer himself for every pass he wants to offer himself um, for every bit of closing down help and you simply can't do that and um, watching the game yesterday the discipline of players for me in, in your individual positions wasn't there you had players making decisions based on their own idea of what they should be doing rather than what's happening to your teammates for instance when Doos is getting closed down in the middle, Kalasinac doesn't need to go in and try and have a jab and try and nick the ball as well. Because what he does is, as soon as he walks in, he leaves his man free on the wing. And if the ball does get squeezed through the two players, which it did, I mean, right at the beginning of the game, down at left-back um, position, I mean, Trezeguet squeezed it between two players. You yeah. don't need to get that tied up together. What you do is you let one challenge and the other one sits off and is patient a couple of, a metre away or something, ready to pounce. Um, and we don't have that discipline in ourselves. And as much as I like the way Gwen has got the enthusiasm, he has not got that discipline in himself to say, hold on a minute, I'm going to hold back here. I'm going to do what I need to do, not, not what I want to do. And we need more players playing for each other um, rather than, I won't say playing for themselves, that makes them sound selfish, but rather than playing the game that they think they should be playing. They should be playing everybody's game in there. You should be looking at your other players around you. Your defenders from behind should be directing you a little bit. You know, don't go in there. Don't get drawn in, Saeed. That's what I would be saying if I was Kalasinac. Um, if I was, sorry, if I was um, Socrates, I'd be saying, don't get drawn in there. Stay out there. Sit in. Wait, let them boys in front do it. And work that. But we, we kind of do our own thing at times and, it, and we pay the price for it. Yeah, absolutely. What what do you make of Socrates and David Lewis as a partnership? They've come in for a lot of criticism. There's been quite a few individual errors of late. Um, in my opinion, Rob Holding can't come back soon enough. But what have you made of that pair? And is it is it the fact that maybe we're not set up in the, the other areas of the pitch correctly that is amplifying their weaknesses? Or, or do you think they're just not good enough as a pair? 
No, I, I think I think you're right. They're, they're being exposed from because of, like I said, exactly what I just said about what's happening in front, where players are just saying, oh, I'm going to go and close that down and help that out, when really they need to hold their position a bit and let other people do that work and, and, and call that work. What that does is it does open spaces up and it does expose the central defenders. I saw several times on the highlights last night on TV where they stopped play and showed that the space between the two central midfielders was far too big. It was 20 metres or so. And, you know, players of today with their quality and technique, they've only got to just get a yard on you and get inside of you and they can expose that space. So I do believe that's the case, but I think you've got two players at the moment. I like Socrates. I think he's got a lot of good things going for him. He's got little parts of his game that um, that just worry me as a, as a big, tough central defender. I mean, we saw the little incident with um, Wesley when he slapped his thighs, yeah. the reaction from Socrates is not what I want from my captain because if Tony Adams had done that on the pitch, I'd have gone in the dressing room after, little me, little David Ilya, and I would have absolutely took the P-I-S-S out of him, rotten for that. He would have got hammered in the dressing room if he had have done that. And because he's, he's a big, strong, you know, he's, he's like, your, you know, yeah, he's, he's a mountain be, man yeah. in the side. He's a man you want to be strong and, and he's doing things like that. Now, for me, what is going through a player's mind to do that? You know, he can't be concentrating just on his football. He must have other things going on in there. You know, like, how can I sneak this? Or how can I get away with that? Or how can I do that? That ain't the way it goes. Hard work, effort, you know, and, you, and strength. Be strong. Be strong for your teammates. Um, David Luiz, he's got pace issues. So he always drops off. Always drops off. Now, the manager has got a make sure that if he's going to play David Luiz as a central defender, personally, I'd have him in front of the back four with Rob Holden sitting in the back four. I'd have David Luiz as a holding midfield player. Um, but I think what he's got to do, he's got to say, listen, David, you've got to step up to play. You can't keep backing off, backing off, backing off because Socrates ain't covering him. You can't back off, back off, back off because we're allowing teams that shouldn't be getting in our final third as much as they are, getting in there on a regular basis every time. They went forward yesterday. Aston Villa basically got into our final third and had an end product. And that's, that's bad. Yeah, you're absolutely right, mate. Um, there's been a lot of questions asked uh, of Unai Emery since that game at Watford in particular. Um, you know, I, I've had sort of doubts about him and, and what he's trying to implement for a little bit of time now, but I feel like the whole opinion shifted for most people after that Watford game. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on sort of the progress that you feel, or if there has been progress, Arsenal have made under Unai Emery so far. Like, where, where are you at at this moment in time? How do you think the Gunners have got on since, of course, Emery's taken over? Well, if you look at, if you look at results since Emery took over, I think he's, had exactly, he's got exactly the same amount of points from the games that he's been involved in since he took over. That if you went back that many games in Arsene Wenger's last period... That's exactly the same amount Arsene Wenger got. Yep. So we're looking at parity there with the, the end of one manager and the new reign of another. But you're saying to me whether I think he's, you know, he's advanced the team, moved them on. I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm, there's something there that, that, that wants to get started, but I, I don't know whether the players are being communicated it properly, whether they understand what... Um, what the manager's trying to do. It, it's difficult. Um, it's difficult to, to gauge it because you don't know what goes on in training. You don't know what sort of sessions he's putting on. Um, but I'd certainly say that we're in, we're in no um, stronger a position. And, and it's quite ironic, really. I mean, Bruce Rioch was, was at the game yesterday yeah. at half time, And when George left the club, um, and we wasn't in... We was in a decent position, but we was we we sort of fallen away a little bit on the in the league stakes and that we'd probably become a, a six or seven place team. Um and when Bruce took over, we he maintained that. He didn't really move it on. He tried some new things, he tried a different style of play. I kind of think we're in, in that sort of position with Unai. And I think Unai needs to step up, he needs to make some significant and and, and, and changes that say to the the 
fans and, and the players, this is the way we're going to do and we're going to stick to it. I think he needs to be more forthright because all this chopping and changing is just making him see, seem like he's um, not in full control of things. Yeah. And, I, and although the club, I think, as a whole, is much more relaxed around the dressing room, the players, it's, it's, it is a better feeling around now um, from a player's point of view, I, I think. But you know, at the end of the day, it's what happens on the pitch matters to everybody. So, you know, we, we can all be, it can all be like a family and it can be a lovely club and all of that. But at the end of the day, you've got to be ruthless. It's, it's a football match. You've got to win it. And, you know, you've got to win it the right way. And at the moment, I don't think he's took us to that level, if I'm totally honest. Absolutely. I totally agree with you there, David. David, thank you so much, mate, for coming on. Really, really appreciate your time, as always. Uh, do you want to let our listeners know how they can follow you on social media? Well, yeah, I'm just on, I'm just on Twitter, as ever, at Dave Hillier with two R's. Um, I'll be retweeting this later and hopefully um, get, get some comments, get a bit of feedback and we'll see where we go from here, Harry. Brilliant stuff. David, thank you so much, mate, and I'll speak to you again soon. Lovely, buddy. Catch you soon. Bye. That brings us to the end of another episode. A big thanks to every single one of you for tuning in. My thanks to former Arsenal midfielder David Hillier for joining us once again and sharing some insight and his opinions on that absolutely mad game uh, at the Emirates Stadium. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share, all the usual things uh, and stay tuned for some details on our upcoming shows. Just follow us on Twitter to keep up to date with all of those. We'll be back very, very soon with more Arsenal-related content. Until then, take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.